We often talk about the evils of alcohol, how it harms the body and the mind, the damage on society and so much more. But the reality is, things wouldn't actually be as bad as they are, not even close, were it not for acetaldehyde. This is the molecule that our body temporarily breaks down alcohol into. And it's this molecule that is actually far more destructive than the actual alcohol itself, the ethanol. In today's video, we're gonna be breaking down the science behind ethanol and acetaldehyde and explain what it means for you. I'll also be giving you some tips on how to limit your exposure to acetaldehyde because unfortunately, there are other sources aside from alcohol. Guys, a lot of research has gone into this video and I'm so excited to share it with you today. Day, you will not want to miss this. Stay tuned. And ladies and gentlemen, just before we get into the video, if you actually want my personal help stopping drinking, where we help you reframe the way that you view alcohol using something called first principles thinking, please click the link in the description. You can book a call and you and I can jump on a call and see if the Sober Clear program could be a good match for you. It's a completely different way to do things that works if you've already tried AA, willpower, therapy, and other methods in the past. It's a different way to do things. So if you want more details, click the link in the description or go to soberclear.com. And now back to the video. So alcoholic drinks are absorbed into the bloodstream, primarily in the stomach and the small intestine, much in the same way that we absorb water. Due to its chemical structure, once it's in the bloodstream, ethanol makes its way to all of our bodily fluids. It passes more or less every biological membrane there is, including the blood-brain barrier. Most of the ethanol that is absorbed makes its way to the liver. The liver is the body's chemical and detoxification plant, responsible for eliminating not just alcohol, but also the other poisons and pharmaceutical drugs that we ingest. Now, once in the liver, a family of enzymes called ADHs convert the ethanol to acetaldehyde. In this way, acetaldehyde is the major metabolite of ethanol. Being even more toxic than the ethanol from which it was derived, the body doesn't actually let the acetaldehyde linger around for too long. There are at least three different chemical pathways through which the acetaldehyde is broken down into less toxic molecules. The most important pathways involve the conversion of acetaldehyde into a less toxic acetate, which is then broken down to water and carbon dioxide. But although our body breaks down and removes the acetaldehyde pretty quickly, even the few minutes it lingers in our system are enough to cause substantial damage. Let's take a look at why this is so. In one word, reactivity. Acetaldehyde is a highly, highly reactive compound, and it's attracted to many other molecules that it encounters inside of the cell. And the two main classes of molecules that it likes to interact with are proteins and DNA. Now, when acetaldehyde reacts with a protein, it fuses with it and forms one large molecule called an adduct. You don't really have to concern yourself with the chemistry here, but the idea is very basic. Acetaldehyde meets protein, and the two form one big clumped up mess, a very tangled mess. And this mess can either be unstable and reversible or completely irreversible. The latter case is more problematic. Now you have abnormal but stable and irreversible molecules floating around your circulation indefinitely. You've knocked all these proteins out of action and now they can't carry out their intended task. But it gets worse. The body doesn't recognize these newly formed adducts as its own which can trigger immune reactions, inflammation, and ultimately tissue damage. The second major class of molecules that acetaldehyde interacts with is DNA. This is the molecule of life which carries the genetic recipe for making each and every one of us. The adducts that acetaldehyde forms with DNA disrupt the normal cell replication process. Over time, these disruptions can lead to the formation of mutations and eventually cancer. Shortly, we'll look at acetaldehyde's effect on particular organs and systems. But first, I want you to have a look at this table. It summarizes the harmful effects of ethanol, that is, alcohol itself, versus those of acetaldehyde. You'll notice that ethanol exerts only four major types of injury. It induces a fatty liver, causes oxidative stress, scars the liver tissue, so-called cirrhosis, and also causes cancer. Now, with the exception of inducing a fatty liver, acetaldehyde mimics all the destructive actions of ethanol and then some. You have atherosclerosis, which is the buildup of plaque in the blood vessels, cardiomyopathy, which is a disease of the heart muscles, anemia, interference with clotting, and more. This is absolutely 
the last thing that you want to be producing inside of your body. So we covered how the bulk of ethanol breakdown takes place in the liver, meaning that this is where most of the acetaldehyde is produced. And it's no surprise that the liver also bears the brunt of alcohol-related disease. Over time, acetaldehyde's protein adducts build up in the liver. Eventually, they trigger an immune response from the body and you get inflammation. And there's another big problem here. The more that we drink, the less able our liver becomes at breaking down this acetaldehyde. In other words, the buildup of acetaldehyde and its adducts in the liver eventually interferes with the liver's ability to detox itself from the acetaldehyde. Alcoholic liver disease progresses through three distinct phases. Fatty liver, which is more or less universal among heavy drinkers and common among casual drinkers. This reverses relatively when you stop drinking. Alcoholic hepatitis. Now, unlike the fatty liver stage, alcoholic hepatitis has some noticeable symptoms. The most important are yellow skin or jaundice, fatigue, loss of appetite, weight loss, and stomach pain. In most cases, this can be reversed if the drinking stops. And finally, liver cirrhosis. This is the third and final stage. Here, the damage to the liver is so extensive that it's irreversible. At this stage, most of the liver's healthy tissue has been replaced by scar tissue, so-called fibrosis, and this scarring cannot be treated. Now, most drinkers who reach this stage of liver disease have an average life expectancy of around two years. But bear in mind, this figure will vary a lot from one case to the next. Now, we saw that one of the harmful effects of acetaldehyde is the buildup of plaque in the vessels, so-called atherosclerosis. This buildup means the arteries become narrower, making it more difficult for the blood to pass. Atherosclerosis is one of the most common sources of mortality and morbidity worldwide. It can contribute to heart disease, heart failure, strokes, and many more unpleasant conditions. Acetaldehyde can raise the levels of cholesterol and other fatty substances in the liver, and these can be deposited as plaque in the arteries. But atherosclerosis is only part of the problem. Acetaldehyde directly attacks the heart muscles. This leads to various types of damage that are collectively referred to as alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Now, this can take several forms, but basically think of it as a rubber band that has been stretched so hard that it loses its elasticity. This is what acetaldehyde can do to the human heart after years of drinking. The heart muscles become stretched, enlarged, and can no longer plump the blood efficiently. Having said that, cardiomyopathy is still a relatively rare occurrence in the grand scheme of things, affecting up to 2% of heavy drinkers. These people are far more likely to perish from strokes or ischemic heart disease. Combined, these two diseases claim over half a million drinkers' lives annually. The strokes can come about as an indirect result of increased blood pressure and irregular heartbeat related to drinking. The elevated blood pressure puts added strain on the vessels, and the irregular heartbeat can lead to the formation of blood clots. Ischemic heart disease can also come about due to high blood pressure, inflammation, and increased levels of cholesterol. These effects are all dose-dependent. The more you drink, the more severe the symptoms tend to be. As we saw, acetaldehyde is highly reactive with the human DNA. The adducts it forms with DNA disrupts the cell's normal reproductive process. Ultimately, this cumulative damage can lead to the formation of tumors from genetic mutations and chromosomal abnormalities. In 2009, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, which is part of the World Health Organization and United Nations, classed acetaldehyde as a group one carcinogen. This put it in the same group with other proven carcinogens like smoking, asbestos, ionizing radiation, and polluted air. Being a group one carcinogen basically means that the evidence for carcinogenicity is overwhelming. While ethanol is also carcinogenic, acetaldehyde is considered an even more potent carcinogen. It's probably the most important factor behind all the multitude of cancers that we find in heavy drinkers. We have evidence from rat studies that acetaldehyde on its own without any ethanol is enough to promote the formation of cancers. In terms of numbers, these are the most frequent types of cancers found in drinkers, listed from most to least common. Liver, colorectal, esophageal, lip and oral cavity, breast, of the pharynx cancers, larynx. Close to half a million people are thought to perish from alcohol-related cancers 
annually. Heavy or prolonged drinking takes a toll on the immune system, compromising its ability to defend against pathogens. There are many reasons for this. Acetaldehyde and ethanol lower the levels of certain antioxidants in the lungs, and they also affect the integrity of certain important microscopic lung structures, the bronchi and alveoli. They also impair the healthy functioning of crucial immune system cells like T cells and B cells. As a result, drinkers have an increased risk of contracting pneumonia and other respiratory infections like tuberculosis. Alcohol-related tuberculosis alone is estimated to claim over a quarter of a million lives annually. Heavy drinkers are also at an increased risk of contracting potentially serious viral infections like HIV and hepatitis. So, drinking on the one hand lowers your ability to fight off immune infections. But, paradoxically, heavy drinking can overstimulate your immune system, leading to chronic inflammation. Now, remember earlier when we were discussing the adducts acetaldehyde forms for various proteins in the body? Well, these trigger the body's immune response, leading to chronic inflammation. Another cause of chronic inflammation is so-called leaky gut syndrome. You see, Ethanol and acetaldehyde gradually corrode the intestinal barrier that protects the bloodstream from exposure to the contents of the gut. The result is that material from the intestine starts finding its way into the bloodstream, triggering an autoimmune response, chronic inflammation, and ultimately further liver injury. Now, we saw that most of the acetaldehyde is generated in the liver, but unfortunately, this is not the only site. Now, after ethanol ingestion, scientists have also found significant acetaldehyde levels in the brain. Most likely, some of it is made through the same process as in the liver, though there are probably additional pathways. At low concentrations, acetaldehyde on its own induces euphoria. And there is some evidence that acetaldehyde in the brain might actually play a part in the development of addiction, either on its own or more likely acting together with the ethanol. Now, that being said, Apart from a role in developing addiction to drinking, ethanol has one more major characteristic. It is highly, highly toxic to brain tissue. Scientists are not exactly sure how acetaldehyde attacks the brain, but very likely it is a combination of two factors the free radicals and adducts that it generates. Over time, the brains of heavy drinkers literally shrink away, losing billions of brain cells, the so-called neurons, and a few grams of mass. Their brain cavities, the so-called ventricles, enlarge in relation to non-drinkers. The grooves between the folds on the outside part of the brain also become larger as the brain cells die off. In the series of scans, from left to right, you can see how the brain of a problem drinker literally atrophies over the span of six years. The various cavities, folds, and grooves inside the brain become much more prominent as countless brain cells die off. Pretty shocking stuff. As you might have guessed, you can't lose this number of brain cells with impunity. Something has to give. And that something is actually across the board. Compared to non-drinkers, heavy drinkers score lower across almost the whole spectrum of neuropsychological testing. More or less, any cognitive function that you can think of is impaired. Processing speed, problem solving, executive functioning, working memory, visual memory, verbal memory, verbal fluency, and learning visual spatial abilities. The good news is, is that after stopping drinking, most of these cognitive domains will make at least some recovery, though often not completely. How this recovery happens, given that the brain is unable to replace the dead brain cells, scientists aren't quite sure about. But it probably has to do with the existing brain cells forming new connections to replace the dead brain cells. So guys, we covered the bad stuff. Now it's time for a more hopeful note. Getting rid of this stuff, removing it from your system, detoxifying and leading a healthier life. At the risk of being blindingly obvious here, the first and most important step that you can take is to stop drinking alcohol. Most of the other sources of acetaldehyde pale in comparison to the quantities that you generate every time you have an alcoholic drink. Again, if you want help getting in control of your drinking, click the link in the description and book a call, and we can see if the Sober Clear program could be a good match for you. Now, having said that, Alcoholic drinks are not the only source of acetaldehyde in our environment today. Here are some practical steps that you can take to limit your exposure to this toxin. Number one, stop smoking. Acetaldehyde is also produced in tobacco smoke as a byproduct of combustion. Number two is to avoid non-alcoholic processed beverages as they can also be high in acetaldehyde. Especially some artificial flavors like lemon can have very high concentrations. Three is to cut down or eliminate coffee as this can also be high in acetaldehyde. And number four, improve the quality of your breathing air. Polluted air can be high in acetaldehyde and people who live in these environments can show some of the same symptoms as heavy drinkers. So if you're living in a large polluted city, consider extending the 
periods of time that you spend in the countryside and avoid going outdoors more than necessary. You might also want to invest in an air purifier system for your home. Ladies and gentlemen, if you click the video on the screen now, you can also learn three secrets to getting in control of your drinking.